Hey, welcome to one of my videos on aging. Um, so, hey, first of all, check out my new web, uh, my new microphone. I can't really remove this microphone from my hand or from my mouth, otherwise you won't be able to hear me. But this is one of these karaoke microphones that I found for only four dollars at the thrift store. Now I've been looking for a good microphone because the built-in microphone, as you know, for all laptops are really bad. Uh, so I found this one, and this was perfect because I was putting off doing this video because I, I simply couldn't find a good laptop. So the topic I'm going to be covering today is mainly why people should think it is possible to extend lifespan. Why, can, why is it possible? How is it possible for us to live longer? And so first, I want to go through the history of uh, of of the study of lifespan, or actually the history of lifespan is bar is barely it's only about 50 years old. But people have been thinking about living longer for hundreds of thousands or thousands of years. So for back then, it, his, the, 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 the sort of aging was very mysterious. It's, it seemed absolute. It seemed unwav unwaverly impossible to change. That's really out of uh, because people had no clue how it worked. But within the past few decades, scientists have been putting together all these little pieces of why we age using new technologies that we didn't have before. So we had like nowadays we have DNA microarrays, uh, that that can helps map uh, very large scale changes in our biological machine, which I refer to as a machine because that's what we are, uh, not machines of silicon, but machines of carbon and you know got we have many metals, uh, iron, we got magnesium, things that we would find in our laptops such as this one I'm uh, that I'm recording from. This is a magnesium alloy case of my laptop. So we use uh, so we use these things, these these DNA microarrays, along with many other systems, or uh, to measure very complex uh, networks of proteins, fatty acids, carbohydrate interactions in our body. And this is a pretty complex pretty complex task because uh, aging, at least, has been revealed to be a rather non-linear sort of cause and effect sort of thing. It is an interconnected web of uniquely shaped molecules and chemical signals that are constantly interacting each other in the whole sense. In the sense that if you change one, you change the entire sort of uh, dynamic equilibrium. Because if you study general chemistry, uh, chemical reactions have a equilibrium. There's in, in chemistry, there's an equilibrium constant, K, uh, Ka, Kb, Kw for water, acid, base, and so on. So, uh, so st other scientists have been trying to simplify this very complex biochemistry nature uh, that we've been looking at aging for the past few decades, and uh, that in a way that's more understood to be more concrete, less less like looking at binary. So that is the cellular level of aging, and that's the the sort of level where we look at clinically and uh, you know by cell biologists through the microscope. And that can be the effects of aging can be pretty clearly seen in cells, tissues, and organs of the young and old organisms under the microscope and visually, uh, by appearance, the wrinkly skin. So aging was was starting to become less and less of a mystery. So I want to explain the nature of aging. So uh, so the cellular level re aging researchers have determined that many of our diseases that kill us which we attribute to aging, but really it's a disease because aging, uh, I will, as I'll explain later, is a category of diseases rather than simply a mysterious, unstoppable phenomenon. So one of these things is the sort of buildup of gunk inside and outside of our cells. So that's, uh, that's to make an analogy, is equivalent to the drain clogs in your house and oil clogs in our cars. They plug it up, that car cannot function in, in the human a bio biological machine, we basically die of heart attacks and strokes. So intuitively, we know that if we can get rid of these gunk from our drains and cars, that would restore their function. It would work almost as new again. And that would theoretically, and actually not even theoretically, there is a, there's good evidence to show that, that if we clear the gunk from our bodies, the same thing would happen to us. And that is they've been using model systems of you know rats and sheep, and there was just a test there was this test uh, drug a few years ago, actually quite a, a few years ago, called Allogebrium that did that. It broke the uh, different, there's, there's organic chemistry, there's types of chemical groups called alpha diketones, which are reactive groups that form crosslinks that uh, that sticks, uh, that makes our uh, blood vessels stiff. And if, it can, if it's stiff, then it won't be able to contract and blood 
won't flow as easily and eventually the, the, it might rupture. So, and then there's also another a different fact, uh, not just the gunk um, accumulating, but there's also the problem of the cells themselves not functioning properly. That could be attributed to, to like the iron machinery or the steel machinery of the engine itself just wearing off little by little. That's that's not a new idea. That's not a new idea. That's called the wear and tear theory, and it's been there for a long time. But it's now clear that uh, as if we restore the function of these machinery, we can also restore function to our body. And that can be done using certain techniques. Uh, we can use stem cell generated organs to replace that certain organ. Or we could just inject stem cells into that malfunctioning part of the body itself. Although there are, in both techniques, there are certain, uh, certain disadvantages as well as advantages to it, but I'll explain that in a different video. So to make the aging, aging problem, I guess, uh, a little more understandable, I'll use a uh, analogy. So I've I've stressed period previously that the biological body is actually a machine. I say very similar to a machine, but I think it's it wouldn't even be an analogy to say that it's similar to a machine. It is a machine. We are powered by the same thing that powers our TV. Uh, our the food that we eat generates electricity. It's it's actually we're we're electricity powered to generate the electricity to generate ATP, which is the form of biological energy. So a, a car is uh, is structured by metallically. We the car is made of metals, but so are much of our body. Our bones are made up of a form of calcium. Calcium is a metal. If you look at the periodic table, the left hand elements are metals. We also require magnesium, uh, zinc, and copper, and other metals to become the engine of our catalysis of proteins, lipids, and so on. They are coenzymes. It is also similar to allow us to uh, uh, to fuse with new technologies. We we are actually fusing with technologies, uh, actual machines. So how I see this analogy here that we biological machines, which people don't see as machines, are able to fuse with actual metallic machines. One of these examples is a prosthetic arm, which is able to detect even very very faint uh, electrical impulses from our motor neurons in our arms, uh, our, our, uh, we have other technologies that can detect um, electric signals from our brain, and from those little electro electrical uh, impulses, they can move to, to accommodate uh, what we want it to do. So, and, so, and, and prosthetics, prosthetics technology has even been able to recreate sensations that you know you wouldn't think it was possible. Something we, we thought that was unique to our special neurons, but we can actually recreate that sensation and send it into our neurons to our brain. So when we touch something with a prosthetic arm, we can actually feel what we're touching. And we're also now even able to peer through the electrical lens that rekindle eyesight in people who are blind, and uh, to an extent in, a, in the actual. Um, in the laboratory, we were able to store and download memories in the form of chips that was done on mice. So what does this mean, uh, and how can this apply to our cause against aging? So I think th the fact that we are so similar to machines is not a bad thing. It's an asset because that means just like we can hit uh, fix the heart of an aging car, that's the engine, combustion engine, we can do the same for us. We can repair the filtration system of our houses. That means we can do the same of our biological equivalents, which is the liver and the kidney. So, about, so, so from unifying the forces of biology, biochemistry, engineering, bioinformatics, and many of other many of the other disciplines, we have sort of generated a sort of a picture of aging that is manageable and absolutely concrete. So. What should we do now? We have a sort of rather, uh, actually a pretty absolute concrete image of why we age. Now it's, we have to just to get rid of the myth of aging, that it is an absolute force in nature, that there's no way of stopping aging. So yes, change is inevitable, but we, we, if we want to stop change, the only thing we can do that is to stop time itself. But one cannot confuse inevitable change with inevitable aging. It is easier to reverse, <clears throat> to reverse the effects of aging than it is to stop it. And for scientists to generate such, te such technology in our lifetime, 
it, it is conceivable for scientists to generate such technology in our lifetime. It's only about two or so decades away if we, uh, if we have the support of people. So we, we, so I, I just want to leave you with one last quote uh, by Simone de Beauvoir, I think that's his name. Um, I am incapable of conceiving infinity, yet I do not accept infinity. I want this adventure that is the context of my life to go on without end. Thanks for watching my video. See you next time.